My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramer America. I you want to make friends. I'm just trying to make you some money. My job is not just to entertain you, but to educate and teach you. So call me at 1-800-743-CBC or tweet me at Jim Kramer. Over the weekend, we got these very positive but unsourced stories about how a debt ceiling, well, deal. It could be, I don't know, maybe one in hand. Like you, I was pleasantly surprised to see we're not about to degenerate into third world debtor nation status. But then I remembered how the debt ceiling talks played out in 2011. Oh, we hear good things like we heard this weekend, only to realize that they were just trial balloons or even total nonsense. So even though the Dow advanced 48 points, say S&P climbed 0.3%, the Nasdaq gained 0.66%, what happens if things are far more off the rails than we'd like? What if the negotiations are nowhere near done, even as the president's about to leave for Japan on Wednesday? I sure hope it's not the case. But what should you buy, not sell, because we're down a lot, buy if the market gets pulverized in that possibility? Remember, we've been through this before, and the best thing about history is you can look it up. But you have to be smart with your analysis. It's not as simple as finding out what rallied the hardest after the debt ceiling deal in 2011. Well, you don't want losers to turn into winners at this point. You want winners that stayed winners right through the worst of the debt ceiling talks. Fortunately, money managers haven't had this much cash on the sidelines since 2009. Those were the generational lows for the averages. So we are looking indeed to buy, buy, buy. and not sell, sell, sell. If the talks do break down this time, you can bet the focus will be on uncertainty, credit concerns, and, yes, the possibility of a recession, just like we were worried about a recession in 2011. That's what it was all about then. So what worked back then? Do you know what? I found a list of eight stocks that performed incredibly well all year in 2011 with the breakdown in the debt ceiling talks giving you a tremendous temporary buying opportunity before they powered ahead into year end. These stocks were all tightly clustered with some no longer relevant and some simply not worth considering. So the order really won't matter that much. But you know what is ironic? Our first name from back then is front and center again today. It's called One Oak. Yep, the natural gas pipeline company that just announced this morning it's buying Magellan Midstream Partners for $19 billion. The merger is a little odd in that Magellan ships refined products, One Oaks Natural Gas, neither Tulsa based company has a coveted pipe to the oil rich Permian Basin. Still, I think this deal's a match made in heaven, even without the 2011 precedent. Back then, One Oak ran from the mid 20s and changed to the high 30s from the bottom to the top after the debt downgrade. It was a terrific performer during that period, with the only decline coming at that moment of maximum panic for the entire market. <laughs> The stock's down barely today on news of this Magellan deal. It's an arbitrage deal, even though I think it's a good one. And you can buy the stock, the best natural gas pipeline in the country. Bountable 6.6% yield. I like it. Next, consider Ross Stores. That's the off-price discount chain, which ran up 7 bucks from its 16 and change bottom in 2011. Now, Ross reports Thursday, and while I, I don't hate it, I am a much bigger fan of TJX, which reports on Wednesday. Now, we own TJX for the Travel Trust, and we're telling members of the investing club that it should have a good quarter because so many nearby Bed Bath & Beyonds are vanishing. Now, I want to see what they have to say. For all we know, TJX might tell us that Bed Bath inventory is all over the place, driving down prices. So we have to wait to see where it settles. The ideal thing is to buy some tomorrow and then buy some more TGX after reports Wednesday morning when we will be talking about it at our monthly club call. Fill everybody in. We know the off-price stocks worked during the last debt ceiling showdown, so I think that gives you extra confidence it's going to work again. Now, here's one I think is some real opportunity and it was surprising to see. Chipotle. Yeah, these guys just reported a terrific quarter. This stock came in hot going into the last debt ceiling crisis by our clock, then roared from 270s to around 340 if the crisis was solved. Chipotle trades erratically at all times, but the best time to buy it is when you have the most current information. And right now, that information is fresher than an Alpa store. I say, <laughs> Chipotle. Hey, next, we own Humana for the Charitable Trust. And while we didn't pick it for its extraordinary outperformance after the Standard Poor's downgraded the U.S. debt in 2011, it certainly doesn't hurt. Back then, the stock roared from 65 bucks to nearly $90. Like the others, it had been strong all year, then dipped into the worst of the debt ceiling 
fiasco and then caught fire again. I think you manage the ultimate stock for anyone who's worried about a recession that might not happen. Now, you may have reported the best numbers both before and after, uh, and I think they can do it again. I really like this stock. Now, I've been eyeing the stock of MasterCard ever since that great last quarter that it just reported. And sure enough, you know what? It turned out to be a tremendous winner in 2011, too, assuming you bought the stock before it rebounded like crazy. After all this German dragon about fintech, it turns out that MasterCard's been the fastest grower, most consistent operator in that space for ages. No credit issues because they don't actually lend money. Lots of special services that distinguish you from Visa. It would be a gift if this stock pulls back and reacts to a inevitable breakdown in the negotiations. Bye, bye, bye. I have a tougher one with the next. Really, this is a tough one for me. The next one is Biogen, because there's so much good news in it about both its Alzheimer's drug and a potential treatment, or at least a marker for ALS. Now, these are horrendous, horrendous diseases. And all this good news for Biogen makes the stock a speculative behemoth. But I think it's unlikely to repeat its post-debt ceiling run from the high 70s to above 100. That's what we saw in 2011. You know what? I prefer you to go with Eli Lilly, which has a similar drug for Alzheimer's, but also has a diabetes and weight loss combination, which can be taken separately under the name Mujaro. This drug doesn't just cause you to lose about 15% of your weight in an incredibly short period of time. It's also being tested for high blood pressure and excessive drinking. It could be a wonder drug. Finally, there's Intuitive Surgical, the robotic surgery play that we recently had on the show. Wow, is it a good story. And it was great back then in 2011. Intuitive was at that point still focused on prostate-related illnesses, a smaller market. But now its machines are used for all sorts of ailments. They go into your pancreas, your liver, your gallbladder. The whole robotic surgery industry's had a renaissance of late after a full stop caused by COVID. And I think the numbers here will be good enough that Intuitive Surgical can rival its run from the bad days of 2011, a run that took it from the 30s to the low 50s. What a stock to buy. Bye, bye, bye. There's a theme here, of course, healthcare, discounters, fintech without credit issues, and a pipeline play. They're all defensive, with the exception of MasterCard, although MasterCard's unique as far as the financial technology names go, and I say expensive, it's good. Well, you could also argue that Chipotle is not defensive, but at the time, it sure seemed like it. I wish I were less skeptical of a theoretical debt ceiling deal falling apart or coming together less than perfectly, but in the 2011 talks, there was a sense that something had to happen and someone had to give. And that's someone being President Obama, because he wanted to get reelected the next year. Now it's President Biden who's acting like there's a deal. And the Republicans say there's no such thing. Sure, they can kick the can down the road, but the closer it gets to the election, the worse it gets for the White House. I hope Biden's just trying to negotiate as hard as he can. But right now, it seems like both sides are willing to take way too much risk with our country's finances. The complacency confounds me, makes me a little more negative than I would be given all the cash from the sidelines. So the bottom line, take these current negotiations with what we know from the history of 2011, and then you'll be ready for whatever this moment throws at you. Now you've got a buy list if it gets really ugly, one tested by the great debt fiasco of 2011. Let's go to Shane in Alabama. Shane. Hey, Jim. Thank you. You're still thank my you. favorite cameo in Iron Man. Oh, that was fun in that one. I like that. Thank you for mentioning it. What's going on? Jim, you're a true superhero, saving us from monetary mayhem. My question is about Hostess Brands. Is it a buy right now or wait for a sweeter price? Well, I think at Andy Callahan's doing a remarkable job. They've really reinvented that company, and I'm going to say it is a buy. They've done terrific. i got to get him back on the show. What a nice move. What a good thing he's done here. Let's go to Chris in Pennsylvania, please. Chris. Hey, Jim. It's Chris from, from uh, Hazleton, Pennsylvania. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How about you? All right. I um, just have a question about uh, um, Goodyear Tire. Well, Goodyear tires up uh, just a very, very quick 40%. Uh, on Elliott, fi Elliott Partners filing to say that there should be a lot more that can be done here. Rich Kramer uh, has been co has come on the show before, but the stock has been a loser, and now it's becoming a winner. And I've got to tell you, if it comes down a little, I would pull the trigger, not up here, because it just moved 40%. Let's go to Joe in Georgia. Joe. Jim, love your show. I wanted to ask you about Berkshire Hathaway. How do you feel about it? Oh, Berkshire Hathaway is terrific. And I got to tell you, I spent all day listening to Becky do that great interview. And that was some learning lesson. All I did was come back thinking even better feelings about how much I like Berkshire Hathaway, including the fact that they have an excellent succession plan. All right, if you're nervous about the outcome of the debt ceiling talks, just remember we've been through this before. 
This time around, you just have to be smart with your analysis and look at the stocks I just mentioned. Well, man, buddy, tonight worries about a government default continue to hang over this market. But one place where we're about to see a bunch of government spending, infrastructure. As money from spending packages begins flowing to the states, I'm buying one player that stands to benefit. I'll reveal the name when I sit down with the CEO just ahead. Then, at confusing and turbulent moments like this one, I'm putting emotions to the side and going off the charts to find out what the, tech, the technicals are saying. And they're pretty darn interesting between the NASDAQ and the S&P. And Planet Fitness took a tumble after reporting earnings. But as concerns about a recession linger, could a consumer trade down drive additional upside? I'm sitting down with the CEO. So stay with Kramer. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on Twitter. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Tweets. Send Jim an email to madmoney at CNBC.com or give us a call at 1 800 743 CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.